known throughout the throughout the United States for taking these terrible pictures of rare birds. And now I can claim international fame. I'm, well, I'm, I'm, at the end of this talk, I'm going to be um, known beyond the borders of the United States. And this is very exciting. Uh, so I push down and nothing happens. Try your right arrow key. Nothing up, nothing. Okay. If you go to the lower left of your screen, yeah. you should end up with a couple of arrows down there that you can use. No, I don't see anything. There. You go. So this is the very antithesis of what I'm known for. And this beautiful picture of a common red pole uh, was not taken by me. Obviously, one of my partners before I retired was very interested in photography. And if you put on your Alaska hat and we're lucky enough to live up here, this is a very common bird. So the very antithesis of what I'm known for. This is much more typical of one of my pictures, an extraordinarily bad picture of a very, very rare bird. Now, this is not my mo most famous picture, and I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. Oh. But I wanted to show you my phone, arguably my most famous picture of a bird. And this, of course, as you all recognize, is a famous uh, Mugamaki flycatcher on Shimia in the Western Aleutians. And this was taken on May 24th, 1985. So this has an interesting history. And I'm going to show you one of the reasons that we were able to get this. And that's this book. The Birds of Japan, which came out and is wonderful compared to what we were using. You can see that they actually look like birds. Before this, when we went out in the Western Aleutians or to these remote spots looking for Asian birds and strays, we used uh, Peterson and Mountfort's A Field Guide to the Birds of Britain and Europe, and Ben King's Birds of Southeast Asia, which was really useless. And so when this book came out, we were actually able to identify birds like this. Now, the Aleutian Islands, and I'm going to show you a map of showing those in a minute, extends way south. The southernmost point in the state of Alaska is on the Aleutians. And so it gets dark at night. And this was about 930 at night. It's getting dark. And I saw this damn bird, and I said, now, what is that? And I started paging through that book. You know, and it came up Mugamaki flycatcher female. And I'd go to the end, there was nothing, then I'd go back the other way. And uh, I took about nine pictures of similar quality, nothing great. And when I got back, I sent the pictures up to Dan Gibson at the Museum of the North at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks. And um, Dan at that time kept the official list for the state of Alaska. And he said, yeah, you know, I don't have anything here. It looks well, what I have. It would suggest it's a Mugamaki flycatcher. Um, Dan doesn't like pictures anyway, but he said, send it to an expert. And if you have an expert say that it's a Mugamaki flycatcher, I'll add it to the Alaska list. So I said, who should I send it to? You have to understand, I moved, I was recently up here. I'd only lived here seven years then, and it's kind of different birding from where I'm used to. I'm from the New York City area. He said, I said, who should I send it to? He, I don't know anyone. He said, I don't either. So I said, well, when I was a kid, I used to bird with Ben, ben King. Should I send it to Ben? He said, yeah, see what Ben has to say. So I sent it to Ben, and I've got to get the letter he wrote. But it was something along the lines of, dear Dave, thanks for the nice picture of the Mugamaki flycatcher. Please send my uh, love to Andy and the kids, Ben. And Dan Gibson up in Fairbanks, who's known at times to use four letter expl expletives, used a number of those um, with regard to the quality of the letter that Ben had sent. I said, Dan, what do, you, what do you want to say? I don't know anything. He said, well, no, I'm usually an expert and Ben's at the American Museum in New York City, the largest bird collection in the world. He said, usually they'd say, well, we went through the collection of the American Museum and there are 250 specimens of Mugamaki flycatcher and uh, this could only be a, a Mugamachi flycatcher because of this and that. And compared to the similar uh, uh, Dumateria, uh, a non-migratory flycatcher of Southeast Asia, 
uh, that clearly rules it out because of the extent of orange in the flanks and blah, blah, blah. He said, but you got an expert to say it was a Mugamaki flycatcher. So he put it on the official list. So he then sent it to the American Birding Association, the ABA checklist committee, who circulated. And while they were circulating it, um, Dan, got, Dan got very nervous about the quality of this picture, which you'd have to agree is not great. And he decided for a first North American record, it would be best um, with a, quali a picture of this quality to put it on the hypothetical list. Well, ABA was already circulating it, and they came up with a conclusion that this was a Mugamaki flycatcher. It could be nothing else. And so it goes on the official ABA list. The AOU, the American Ornithological Union, which is now called the AOS, um, has a convention that they do for, for taxonomy, for adding birds to lists. They do science, and the ABA does photos, stuff like that. So they automatically put it on their list. I have to tell you, one of the letters came back from, um, I'm drawing a blank on his name, a famous ornithologist at the Smithsonian Institution National Museum in Washington, DC. And I do have that letter. When you come up to Anchorage, I'll show it to you. Because the first page of a two page letter goes on and on about the damn Alaskans and they throw all the, you know, what all over. His son is an internist up in Fairbanks. He said, my son's backyard looks like a junkyard. And you have to do something about all these Alaskans saving all this junk, like what this bird is sitting on. Then he says, is it a Mugamaki flycatcher? Yes. Could it be anything else? No. And based on the 150 Mugamaki flycatcher specimens in the National Museum, blah, blah. He said, but quick, the world's expert on this is Ben King. Send it to Ben and see what he has to say. Well, Dan didn't like that, and it remains on the hypothetical list for the state of Alaska. And I think I'm the only person on earth who has a bird on their life list that's on the official AO ABA list, the official AOU list, and is not on the official state list. It's, it's two things I'm famous for. Well, here's a picture of Alaska, and can you see the arrow? Does the arrow come up when I move the arrow? Yeah. So yes. these, are, these are the Aleutian Islands. They extend way south and way out west. These are the five named near islands. They're called the near islands because they're near to Russia. And I'm embarrassed to say that I've spent more than a year on my life on the near islands. I've spent, I counted up 62 weeks. Sleep. Mostly on Shimia, uh, I, I spent a lot of time on Shimia, which is one of these little dots, and then on Attu, which is the largest of the islands. Um, I think you can see that this map of Alaska is overlaying the map of the United States. And with Attu being in Los Angeles, down here, Ketchikan um, is in Jacksonville, Florida. Alaska is enormous. It's by far and away the largest state in the nation. That probably means less to you than it does to us. So this is uh, my first uh, lucky place to be able. This is Shimmy Island. It's a top secret island. At the time, it was an Air Force base. And in real life, I'm a doctor. And I was doing consulting work at Elmendorf Air Force Base Hospital in Anchorage and finagled my way to provide their medical care for a week. Uh, a year during the spring migration. And it's a flat island about four miles by one mile. Uh, in the dark that occurs at, at night, uh, there are navigational aids that are glowing and it attracts migrants. It's wonderful, they're deep wet freshwater lakes. It's wonderful learning. Um, this big building here has offices and living quarters. And a number of the personnel would go from the airplane, which is uh, landed on the runway to the right, go into this building, uh, their living quarters, their offices, all the uh, places to eat are in there, and they would not leave the building until they went back home. Let's see what we can do now. Click the next on the top there. Oh, this was a cool place. As I say, there are 
uh, I'll show you some pictures of some of the uh, stuff they were doing on Shimia. But I, this was built, uh, built new uh, after I started going out there and I was driving around with one of the medics. I said, what's that? And he said, I'm sorry, sir, we're not allowed to tell you. That's all top secret. But if you look in the Time magazine from October 11th, there's an extensive article on what it is. Which... This was an area where uh, it had um, antennas and someone 20 years after I was there, who was a retired uh, Air Force officer, said that he was pretty sure this antenna field uh, was out there to uh, send a signal to submarines to launch nuclear warheads in Russia. But it is unlawful to enter this, uh, uh, and you can see on the bottom, use of deadly force, force is authorized. I never tested to see if they would shoot me if I went out there. And I was never tempted with the rare bird, which was fortunate. This is Atu, which is magnificent with mountains, this harsh um, mountains going right into the sea. In front, there's an old landing craft from the Second World War. There was a, this was the only place in the United States where we have been invaded since the War of 1812. And there was a large battle here with Japan. I think 500 men were killed and all of the Japanese except for 11 were killed. Um, but all over this island are relics of the Second World War. These buildings uh, are in the process of falling down. This was called Navy Town. There were three buildings landing. This was a bar. This is the hospital. And there's a jail and those are cells on the left-hand side, the brig for people who got in trouble. I thought this was kind of a poignant thing I found behind a sand dune once and, and just see a bunch of guys who were really tired of the war and really tired of being the Western Aleutians with not enough food and not and poor equipment. And they said, we're ready to leave. And they left their helmets there. Those are probably no longer, they probably rusted to dust now. So this is where the battle was. This is uh, West Massacre Valley. These are trenches where the Japanese were looking down towards the landing craft. The Americans came over the mountains here and landed here and on the beach and very bloody battle. Uh, this is, oh, I meant to look up the name. It's a, a twin. Does anyone know the name of this airplane? So World War II, it was just subsonic propeller with two V-12 aluminum block engines that were fluid cooled. It was sitting out of the tundra. And there are not very many of these left, and they made an effort and brought this particular plane from Atu back to Anchorage. And if you come to Anchorage and go to Elmendorf Base, Air Force Base, that's the exact same plane. Is it a P P-47? I'm not sure. I'm better at birds. There was a commercial operation called Atours that went out to Atu with birders for 25 years based on this particular airplane which is just before jets. It's a Lockheed Electra with four turboprop engines and a big haul load. So it could take 60 or 70 people and enough food for several weeks. And he had a big operation going where uh, when the last plane came out to pick people up in the spring, they'd bring a lot of food that would last a year and store it, uh, fuel and stuff like that. Um, this is one of the uh, last trips. These are a bunch of American, mostly American birders. There's probably some Canadians too. Uh, here's Dan Gibson up in the corner there. And his wife was a wonderful cook and used to cook for us. And everyone looks happy because there are rare birds around. With this number of people, if you saw something rare, you could do a sweep. So a snipe happened to land in that field and we just got everyone in a line and managed to kick up a pintail snipe. Behind us is this road, which goes out to the old World War II runways, which I don't think I have a picture of. Really high quality people there. This is uh, Larry Balch going through garbage uh, with uh, Al Driscoll, who uh, has a double major in physics and engineering and kept everything going. So we had hot and cold running water. We had electricity and Al, who was a birder, We'd been out there a number of times. We'd just go out and look at a new bird. And other than that, he just stayed around and poked around and kept things going. 
These are old Loran A stations, which are owned by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which had an agreement with Pat Tours, so we stayed in them. You can see there's a four-wheeler that Larry brought out to pull stuff around. Um, he brought bicycles out, which was great because it was like 10 miles one way to Bo Birding. And uh, very good food, a list of all the birds that were seen, an Attu specialty, a specialty of white-tailed eagle, which nested there. It was seen during the Second World War, and they think it might have been the same eagle that we were seeing uh, 50 years later. I'm pushing the wrong button. We had very comfortable, dry uh, accommodations with comfortable beds. Oh, some of you may not have seen this bird. Does anyone see this bird? I have to tell you, I took this picture also in the 80s. I had the good fortune to have a job where I had quite a bit of time off and spent wonderful time with my wife and kids floating down rivers in the books. And I took this picture, and now after, whatever, 40 years, every time I show it, I have to look to where the damn bird is. And when I first showed Dan Gibson this book, this picture, he immediately, in a second, said, wow, that's a great picture of a gray-headed chickadee. And there it is enlarged. So it looks like a black cap chickadee. It has an extensive white face. It has that gray head. It differs from a boreal chickadee, which has much less white in the face. So a real, my second species of really rare bird, terrible picture. If you were wondering if I've made the change from film to digital, I have effortlessly and continue to do a terrible job of photography with my new digital camera. This is Dan Gibson. Uh, and his wife, uh, Jennifer Jollis, as I say, Jennifer is a wonderful uh, gourmet cook, and we eat very, very well out there. Uh, this is a rambling. Have you had ramblings this winter in Victoria? Yeah. Yes? No? No, it's been quite a while since we've had a rambling in Victoria. We're, we're overdue, for sure. There's one in Washington State? Yes. And there was, like in the spring, a hundred in Nome, and Nome is a little teeny piece of Alaska. There must have been thousands in the state that came through. They nested in Nome, second breeding record. And um, there were seven in Homer, Alaska, near Anchorage. There have been two in Anchorage, or Seward, Kotzebue. So we're seeing quite a few this year. It's not uncommon to, common to have one or two somewhere in the state in the winter. This is a very common bird in the Western Aleutians. I don't think I ever saw more than, say, 500 in a day. This is a cuckoo. I think this is my favorite <laughs> bird. It's a, it's a common cuckoo, probably. We also get oriental cuckoos and have, in the last 20 years, figured out how to tell them apart. But I think this big arboreal bird, they've evolved to look like a hawk. So when they fly over a bush and there's a little bird with a nest, the little bird will come out and challenge a hawk. The cuckoo then finds a nest and is, a par is parasitic and lays its egg in another bird's nest. And they're really neat. I think landing on Ad 2 or landing in the Western Aleutians is a lethal event for them, but I still like them. White wagtail. Wood sandpiper was an annual bird out there. You've had those in, in BC, I'm pretty sure. These are really pretty little bird. I wish it was a better focus, but a Mongolian plover, now called a lesser sand plover. But Mongolian plover is better because then you can say it's a mongo. Did you see any mongos today? We used to get those fairly regularly. It looks like it should be rarer than it is. They're changing the name back to Mongolian plover. You'll be happy to know. I just heard that from a birder in a uh, so in from Thailand that a study has been done and they are genetically different and they're back to Mongolian just as of the last week or two. So I can get my kicks off calling this dainty little beautiful bird a Mongol. You ever see a Mongol? This is a first spring record of a little stint in the Lucians, a bird on the left. It was with about 40 redneck stints, which are annual. This is a 
long toed stint, you can see it has yellow legs like a leaf sandpiper, has different coloring from a leaf sandpiper, and a double supercilium, which you can get a hint of even in this awful picture. Uh, this is a second record for spring for a uh, uh, little stint. It's a nice spring bird. It has red on the face, and the red tends to be, or the rufous, uh, tends to be more laterally in the redneck stint. It tends to be in the middle. This is the first documentation of green sandpiper uh, for North America. If you consider the Western Lucians, North America. And I sent this to Dan. He said, oh, we can finally get that off the hypothetical list because he only has birds on the official list that are photographed or a specimen or a song that's been recorded. I said, gee, Dan, it's not a very good picture. And he, yeah, but, and he doesn't like pictures. And then after about 20 years, I realized I'd been looking at it upside down. And it looks better, much better right side up. So that's an, another quite rare sandpiper. Uh, Black-tailed godwit. That was sort of a jinx bird for me until we finally had them show up. Oh, this is a broad-billed sandpiper, and that's really another real rare sandpiper. This is a September bird, and that's when they're so. That's when they show up. This is a neat picture. This beautiful sandy beach on the south side of Shimia with the Pacific Ocean which is a light blue in the background, and a Far Eastern curlew and a wimbrel, um, kind of neat. The other side, the north side of Shimia, is black basaltic rocks and a black Bering Sea and quite different looking. This is the first record for the illusions of spectacled eider. This was an Atu bird. It's not a bad photo for me. Oh, this is a white-throated needle tail. That was kind of cool. That's a really rare swift. Um, and actually, considering it's a swift, it's not a terrible picture. Uh, this is a great spotted woodpecker uh, using the equivalent of a tree and the illusions. The illusions are characterized by the absence of trees. Isn't that a nice bird? Um, olive back pipit. I'm going to run through some of these. Uh, Oriental turtle dove, bean geese. This is back on Adak, which is 400 miles this side of Atu. And someone had a bird feeder at their apartment. There are now about 60 or 80 people living there. And look what came into the bird feeder at a hawfinch. This is the first documented record for breeding of whooper swan in North America. And you can't tell from this picture, but we had a bunch of people that went in there to see it. And then another bunch, it was a long slog. And then I was sort of one of the leaders. I was one of the leaders. And on the third day, I took a group of people in. And we were looking at this thing. And there were two young birds, about maybe eight inches or a foot long. So we knew that they had not migrated there. So we had the first nesting record of whooper swan in the United States. Whooper swan winters in the Aleutians. They come out from the Asian mainland quite far along the Aleutian chain to winter. This is the first re uh, reading record of a brambling. These are Arctic foxes, which were released on the island by Russians in the, seventh, in the 18th century, 17th, 18th century, and really devastated the um, uh, birds on the island. Uh, they were removed uh, by the U U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And we used to see one Aleutian Canada goose and two, two Aleutian Canada geese a year. And there are now literally hundreds and they're nesting on the island. They're all over. And they're probably making a mess of your golf course right now. So hmm. something happened with the uh, um, sea otters. We used to see a couple of hundred a day and then something happened and we were only seeing a few a week. It may have been related to killer whales, uh, blue, uh, um, killer whales, I'm drawing a blank on the other name, um, orcas. Uh, 
with the great uh, Alaska pollock fishery, there may there was a there's been a big decrease in stellar sea lions, and not enough for the orcas to eat. So they may have started eating these things, but they're mega cute. You get them, I'm sure. There's an orca off of Shimmy on the Pacific Ocean. So there we are. We've been slogging along, living in crowded, dry quarters and warm, but crowded, tired of birding, want to go home. Great stress because the Aleutians are, of course, famous for weather, bad weather. And we're all out there. It's a two mile hike out to uh, where the um, airplane lands and everyone's waiting for the airplane to land, nervous and hope they can get in. And they get in and everyone you see people cheering and taking pictures and there are 60 or 80 birders on the plane waiting to get off and 60 or 80 birders waiting on the get on the plane and go home and see the sun and have them stop raining. And, you know, this is June 1st and everyone's bundled up. And this airplane has an air starter, which frequently goes bad. So the second officer is taught how to put in a new starter. And when the plane landed, the starter went. So they asked for a vol volunteer birder to help the uh, pilot put in a new starter. He just wanted someone to hand tools to him. And the alternative was dragging all of that gear and food and luggage two miles. So I immediately put up my hand and I handed him tools. And after he got the new starter, I said, hey, take a picture of me pretending like I did something with your engine, which I obviously didn't. So he took this picture, which is even more amusing because there were 80 bird watchers waiting to go home, looking at me, looking in their engine. It didn't make them feel good, but they made it, no one died. So the next place I wanted to show you is some pictures from another um, island, and this is St. Lawrence Island. And St. Lawrence Island is off the coast of Nome. Nome is about here and here's St. Lawrence Island. And we're on this little point, which is called Gamble. Here we are coming into Gamble. There's a large freshwater lake called Troutman Lake. There's a barrier beach and another barrier beach. And this is pointed towards Russia. Um, they no longer hunt whales with these uh, walrus skin boats. They were till 20 or 30 years ago. They're now using aluminum, but that's a Mac. And this is the end of May. If you think Attu is cold and miserable, look at this sitting on the sea ice, waiting for something to fly by. And every morning and every night, 800, a million, plus or minus 200,000 alcids fly by this point. This is just streams and streams of crested offlets. East Auklets, Parakeet Auklets, both puffins all going there. And if you look past the alcids, and you can see a flock of crested auklets and a myrrh here, and there's Russia. This is why so many Alaska birders have great insight into Alaska, into Russian foreign affairs, because we can actually see Russia from our state. This is uh, the village. Uh, the, these are middens, which are turned over by the local people looking for artifacts to sell to people. Uh, it's a very poor community. Because of these, these middens, there's lots of organic matter from being lived in for 2,000 years. So um, they green up early. There's stuff for birds to eat. And we drag ourselves through those several times a day looking for rarities. There's a group of birders looking for rarities. Um, uh, palaces reed bunning, something I've never seen. These are pictures I borrowed by Cal Teal. Another nice rare bird. We'd nice to see a male, but it's better to see anyone. Um, this is a, a, a yellow browed warbler, willow warbler, stuff that's really rare, and then stuff that's not so rare. This is a, a weed ear. Weed ears nest in Anchorage. They, it's kind of cool. So they're migrating from Asia over to North America. They nest 
at least as far east to Anchorage, and I'm sure they go, I think they go into the Yukon. But the neat thing about wheat ears is all of the world's wheat ears uh, winter in sub-Saharan Africa. They're not known to winter in Southern Asia and certainly not in Southern United States. So that bird flies across the Bering Sea, across Asia, through the Middle East, across the Sahara Desert twice a year. And I think that might be it. So thank you. I'm now internationally famous for terrible pictures. Thank you so much, Dave. Is, has anybody got a question? If you'd like to, you can put it in the chat or you can unmute your microphone and ask David and he will attempt to answer it. And David, you can put stop sharing, click on stop sharing so that we can see the, the masses. I better not do anything. I better accept what we have. Anne. Okay, I can stop your sharing. I can do that for you. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Good. Anybody have any questions? Well, I hope you'll come up and visit. And I frequently take cruises because I like ocean birding. And uh, maybe we'll see some of you in Victoria. Okay, thank you do very you much. Any, do you have any birds left, David, that you are hoping to see in Alaska? Oh, sure. You know, there are lots of single records. I was on uh, St. Paul Island, the Pribilofs, in the fall when we got a call that there was a hoopoe. There are two prior records for hoopoe for, for Alaska. Boy, wouldn't that be something? So we rushed. I mean, we went about 10 miles in five minutes and we're lucky we survived. And the hoopoe had been seen 10 minutes before we got there. Uh, Sully Gibson, who runs the uh, Pribilof tours, was there before we were, and no one ever saw it again. But there's a little chat for the neighbors and uh, someone said, oh yeah, I saw one of those birds that was dead and we picked up a dead hoopoe. So there were a live one and a dead one, but we never saw it. That would, I think I'd like to see that. I know I'd like, I would to like to see one of those. Yeah. So we actually had yellow-browed warbler here a few years ago, which was a pretty special bird for this area. I would say there are only about three records for Alaska, maybe five. Is that the only record for Canada? I bet it is. Um, I don't recall if it's the only record for Canada or not. I know they had a couple of them in California. I think the same year that we had the one here. Yeah. So that, you know, maybe it was the same bird. Who knows? <laughs> okay. Well, Did if you... there are no questions, I just want to thank David very much for sharing his pictures, regardless of what he thinks of the quality of them. Uh, I think that, that he did prove something, and that's that sometimes you don't need to have the very best photo to be able to prove that you saw a rare bird. So don't feel shy about sharing your bad photos. I know a lot of photographers who will delete every picture that is not perfect. Sometimes a crappy photo does the job. And so don't be too anxious to take those off your, off your cameras. Um, they may still have a purpose. Yeah, I would second that. I mean, and, and in the modern era, everyone has a, a camera and, and it's really great. When we were on Attu, there were no digital cameras, and there were only about two or three of us who even had a camera because everyone else was out bird watching. So there are other birds which I just happened to have a camera and no one else did. I was yellow browed, uh, yellow throated bunny. But yeah, bring a camera that my phone, this is a phone scope and it fits on my scope and does a very nice job of taking pictures. So that's another thing for a hundred bucks, you can get that and put it on your iPhone. And right, so does that mean that, that your next presentation will be the good pictures that David Sonborn's taken? Oh, no, 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 nothing like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thanks so much, David. I really do appreciate you, you doing this for us. And, oh. uh, and if anybody does think of a question, um, uh, is it all right if I give them your contact information? Sure, absolutely. And uh, as if someone's going to be up here in May, I'd love to go birding. I'm, I bird every day. 
Love to okay. That's awesome. I will give Rick and Doreen your contact information. Okay, great. And have you got any trips to Victoria planned? Um, probably not. It's a screwy May. Right. But, you know, it's it's just a lot of stuff happening. I'm I'm looking at. I, I like opera. I'd love to go see the uh, Flying Dutchman in Vancouver. Well, there there are a couple of uh, thank yous in the chat, and someone says an exceptional talk. Thank you very much. So, uh, so yes, now you can add internationally renowned to your <laughs> biography. Thank you very much, Anne. Thank you, everyone. We'll talk to you soon. Okay, good night. Thanks, David. Oh, thank you. Okay, so uh, do remember to check the calendar for other upcoming talks. Rocky Point Bird Observatory also is doing more talks and Victoria Bird Week is coming up in May. So keep tuned for that, more information on that. And uh, we hope to see you all again soon. Bye for now. Rick, you can, uh, stay on the line if you can. Oh, great. <laughs> Recording. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs>